Hi everyone, welcome to Talking Family History with Michelle and Fiona and we're ready for this week's news on the 28th of April 2023. That's another and month gone. I know and we've missed Anzac Day for those of you that, that commemorate that but I hope you all got our um, alerts in our Facebook site and we did do a special post so on our YouTube channel but also we're going to miss the coronation coming up but we will be back before Mother's Day Down Under. And we also missed the DNA Day news that was also the 25th of April, but we also posted that on Facebook so that you got news about what was available that would be gone by the time you heard us talk today. So I'm going to go straight into the update for all the majors first. So mostly updates only at Ancestry that you can see um, they'd be adding more, more records to these collections. Same in the US, uh, again, back at Bristol, but there's a couple of new uh, US ones, Washington as, and Salt Lake ones, updating again of Oregon. And then there's the Canadian Royal Air Force crash cards. And I thought there might be some interest there and don't think it's just Canadian Air Force. The Australian Air Force was sent often to Wellington, New Zealand to start their training. And then a combined force was sent to Canada to follow their training up. So you may want to make sure you check for Australian and New Zealand uh, personnel in Canada in these records, um, because sadly, as we know, many of them did crash. Over at Genianet, um, the most interesting thing was this blog post, which is showing the certificates they've added to various places around Northern Europe. So particularly that, Danish background, I don't know, but there's a proper term, and I'm tired and it's Friday night, so you'll have to forgive Scandinavian, me. Scandinavian, Michelle. Thank you. I knew you'd <laughs> help me out. I spent too many hours driving in two days. My apologies. But 150 million vital records for this region, you may wish to go and have a click and search. Over at Family Search, um, they're starting a new project. They're asking for people who would like to interest, be interested in participating and testing out this technology. And I'm sure many of you are maybe even over the words of AI and artificial intelligence. Maybe you're all quite aware that the various companies we do our family history research through have been using this technique for some years, like over 10. Um, and sure, it's developing further and further. And the plan they're doing is to look at photographs to see if they can see physical resemblance. And you might want to have a um, be part of that program. The link will be in the description box below. So you can click through and join up. But their records are, again, they're not publishing. They used to do these fortnightly returns that we could easily see everything. So there's census from Guam couple of interesting English and Irish records, particularly Irish Catholic parishes, the two and a half million, you might all want to jump over and have a check of those. Stacks of records from continental Europe and even more since the 26th when I screenshotted these yesterday morning, there's been more releases since then. United States, uh, the biggest chunk there was Mich Mich Michigan births but down even better Massachusetts vital records are a whole swag 11 and a bit million um, way to go if you happen to have people from that part of the planet nothing new for Canada but they do have some Mexican records uh, again good hefty sizes there lots of focus in in these southern American uh, communities as we then head over to seeing very large numbers again in a number of data sets around Central America and the Caribbean and it keeps going in the rest of South America and it's extensive look at 9 million Bolivian Catholic records right up until 1996 um, Colombian Catholic records up to 2018. So a huge range there, 26 million, uh, certainly a tremendous number of records out there. And wait, there's even more, and I just could keep pressing buttons, but you can have a go and check out. But Ven Venezuela, Catholic records, 20 million. Down in South Africa, 2.7 from the Dutch Reformed Church. Again, big swath there from 1660 through to 1970. I um, bet that's very much valued by a number of people. And who could forget um, some of the Benin uh, Olympians over the years, and there's, you know, 92,000 of those. The biggest news at 
find my past since we were last giving you the news was that they've updated their newspaper search functionality. So they used to have a search query field that was very much uh, based on the traditional genealogy records search query field. And they have been in partnership from the beginning with the British newspaper uh, National Library and their newspaper collection. And there's a very different search engine format there. And thankfully, they are starting to tweak that. So if you log in and choose newspapers and journals, when you, if you're a subscriber, you're going to get these four screens explaining to you what you can do, including multiple names handy for marriages and deaths and other people with questions commas between them. Also, there's a whole range of filters that you can use by county and publication place. And wait, there's more, you know, that goes back to the 1700s. So this is what you will initially get is this main page where you could just type in what you want in name and keywords. I left it empty so I could take you a screenshot. So all I did was press the search button and I can show you there's a huge number of data sets here and the drop down filters are all across the top. And I think Fiona, you had some comment to make about this. Yeah, I'm thinking that maybe I might record a wee tutorial this week on using the Find My Past search for the newspapers. Um, there's some interesting little things hiding behind there that are a bit of fun to play with. Fun is definitely the right word, including I just played with some minuses to get rid of my hospitals from my patient surname. Um, but yeah, nice lot of tweaks there that I, I used to find on the old side. I couldn't find the newspaper I wanted because it was this tremendous dialogue box. And if you didn't know which county you were looking for, it was a challenge. So now it's great to see the county one. Um, but, you know, it's the beginning of changes. So you may have some feedback to give. And I'm sure Find My Pass will be happy to have it. But they also have continued to do their um, weekly Friday night bulletins. So last week it was Irish records from Dublin. And this week it's about some interesting things that um, I'll just flick you through. So the Irish stuff, counties Wicklow to Wexford. Good heavens, I need a new set of tooth teeth today. Marriage licenses and wills and grants. So a, a big chunk of information, and I know I'll be checking some of my Dublin people out when I have some time. But, and, you know, a large number of wills, it's great if it happens to be your people had enough money to do that. And further down, there's also information from Guernsey, which is from the papers. So only three new papers last week, but there they are, and they can be most valuable, particularly those Channel Islands research can be um, quite challenging because of the way the archives are. So every newspaper in those regions are very helpful. And then lots were updated. I'm going to just leave that on the screen. If you need to pause, you'll be able to have a close look to see if your area has been covered because there's lots of slides tonight. This week they released post-war English records and there's lots of photos in them, but the really big news is that it's the return of owners of land from 1873. May not be useful for my ag labs, but it might be where my ag labs were working. So there's nearly a quarter of a million or over a quarter of a million images and records within the English and Wales set. You get headings like this in Scotland, so not quite the same information in the Scottish registers. So a very subtle difference. This, the bottom screen is just showing the headers from England. So one's the extent of lands and one's the estimated acreage. Um, one's the gross estimated rental and the other the gross annual value. So there's some subtle differences, but all the same, there is lots of information about our families. And not to be outdone, you can cross over the pond up there. Not sure what they call that waterway in the Irish Sea, but anyway cross over the pond and the return of owners is also there. Um, it was recorded from 1873, but the Irish set wasn't published till 76, which is why it's dated that. Well worth coming and have a squeeze at. I'm just distracted and now. I'm going to go and play. I know. I, I think I, I'll just let you, you can finish the news and I'll just play. Okay, what you I play. Really like about those, maps. This is going to be the news of too many maps, I think. Yeah, um, what I like about those sorry. returns of owners of land as well as that you can put like a village name in and mm. see who is listed so when you're talking about who did my ag labs work for 
you may well find that you can sort of find out who were the landowners in the area. Yeah. Really helpful. Yeah. Searching on Latchley is always fun, is it not? Sure is. Um, and this is a period of time where I have a lot of family photos of my English family, including the Butlins camps. Um, but this particular photographer has a photograph collection. And um, this is, you know, actually a, an entertainer at a Butland camp, you know, spot your relative in the room. But there's quite a nice lot of social history in this, um, this, this set, set that they've added. Bearing in mind that it is Coronation Week for all of us, and that's not Coronation Street, but Coronation Week, there's some focus on the coronation historically. I did have to giggle because I heard a very long conversation today about the meal and the food for the day that our king will be um, eating, which wasn't going to be very much. And then here is the king's menu from, from the past, um, which was excessively large amounts of food. It's an interesting contrast in change of social uh, mores of the time and interests, but there's two new royal collections plus the Farnham Mail uh, new sets for this week. Plus they've updated a number of papers, but the big news would be for those of you with Huddersfield area of interest. So let's just have a look at this page. So there's Birmingham and all sorts of things all over the place. These are the one part of the Huddersfield area with all the years. And wait, there was more. So there's quite a lot for all of that territory as well as the Manchester Evening News. So something for most people in what's been updated this week. Over at MyHeritage, they've added 72 million in the March collection. So this news came out in since we actually last did our report. And the other thing they did, they announced just a couple of days ago that they've added improvements to the, in, the C, Centre Morgan Explainer tool, which they launched at Rootstick this year. In particular, they've changed the wording from probable to estimated because they've realised that the more distant the relationship, it's often not quite so um, specific. Uh, but there's quite a bit of explanation there of the tweaks they've made. Um, I know Fiona and I were both in a meeting uh, of people looking at this behind the scenes in a citizen science project, and certainly in those weeds, isn't it, Fee, they were a little bit more um, undefined. Yeah, it, it's an interesting um, new part of science coming through to an extent. Mm. And it'll be interesting to see it develop over time because one of the things that they've done in the enhancements is they're starting to look at some endogamy areas in yeah. that as well. And um, pedigree collapse. Yeah, so mm. that'll be interesting to see how that gets better over time. Mm. So, yeah, I'm, I hope we live long enough to see it. Um, but specifically, I, I did go and have a look at some of the newest record sets that were relevant to those of us researching the English-speaking world. So Australia, the South Australian death notices and funeral notices, was nearly half a million, which is from 1971 onwards, really useful because South Australia research is a tad limited in the electoral situation. Um, lots of church marriages from Austria, uh, lots of Canadian records. There wasn't just the births and deaths, there were de uh, births and baptisms, there were deaths and burials as well. But I just ran out of pages because I don't know, I stuck it on the top because there was endlessly French census documents. Um, so those of you with French families will find it fascinating that you can go through a number of census areas there. But the thing I actually found really interesting for, because of um, my interest being more English than anything else is this new tools of better scanning over at the genealogist. So I know many of us do struggle with reading the census images from time to time. You know, we all would wish how perfect they'd written uh, the enumerators, but they didn't. Um, and what they've managed to do at the genealogist is they're, they're reimagining the, the images with high resolution grayscale. So they're much easier to read. And so they've just done this now um, on the other record images as well. So they've done an initial rollout on 1891. I don't remember when that was, it was some while ago. Now they've added 51, 61 and 71. 
So you might all want to actually, um, even if it's a short period of time, if you've got some specific census problems where you can't read some information or find some particular information, it might be worth um, having uh, using the genealogist website for a period of time. And especially those ones, Michelle, that you know were written in pencil and or the enumerator, quite honestly, should have dipped his pen back into the ink before he continued. Mm. And I remember sitting, you know, when you used to do this on microfilm and you'd sit there with your yellow piece of paper because yellow helped highlight some of these a bit more than what we were seeing mm. um, as well. And just remember also often on some of the other websites, you can flick and invert your colours as well between black and white and white and black. Yeah, and those inverted even tools. Even that can help. Yeah, and I've, I've thinking of two or three where I can see there's been a lot of overwriting and so mm. you can't clearly see what's writing from the line above or below that's you know very loopy and and you can't really tell now is that a wire is that some link that's come from the the letters above um and, and this I image like, on this one here interesting um relationships yes lots of interesting surnames there but also what's that top relationship nursling is it Yes, but the nurse thing, if you notice the double lines in the corner next to Mabel's the, name, is the that's bottom of the one above. That's the bottom of the group above. Yeah. Exactly. So this starts with um, you know, one would expect that either Susanna has been married twice or Susanna's daughter has married and mm. she's a herd. So either we should be looking for, or she could have been illegitimate. So either Susanna's had this herd surname in the past or Isabella has gained marital status and married a herd. So those things you have to think about. But can't you imagine this is Fleetum, not Heatum? Or is it yeah. a heel? There's some interesting letter construction here. And, and where's Mr? Yeah, she's wife, because she's not wife, widow. not widow. Yeah. So then you start going, okay, where am I? Is it, you know, is he a sailor or something like that? Why mm -hmm. is he not at home? Yeah, and which decade you know they haven't referred in this page mm. where the image comes from so which decade is it which war are they likely to have been in or is there some other reason he might have been traveling away to visit his family like many of our um, partners do do when you know our our mother-in-laws are not well I, I no. bet someone I bet someone won't be able to resist and they'll have to go and have a look for it um, yeah, maybe someone could tell us the answer uh, exactly. in the comments section uh, when they find it, because that'd be fun. So over at Trove, they've uh, published about what's new this month. And so lots of national papers, understandably, around military service, as you can all see. And my father left the Royal Australian Navy uh, three years before the start of this document. So he's not going to be in that one. Um, but the colonial art's an interesting sort of side issue outside. And I bet there's lots of military art in there. Each state, of course, has new releases as well, well, pretty much everywhere. Um, so, and a range of places within New South Wales, not just city focus. Same with Queensland, there's three main papers up there, including the Australian for only a 10 year period. But you know, if that's when your ancestors are in the paper, that's what counts. Again, more uh, South Australia, I'm liking the fact that we're seeing some Port Lincoln from quite a bit later in the 20th century and the good old colonial times and Tasmanian advertiser I'm waiting for 1829 please um Victoria closer <laughs> I know each each week we month we're getting one more year I think uh, lots in Victoria um mostly gold fields at the top but you can see all sorts of odds and sods there right through uh, mostly around that 20th century period and I an important thing with this, Michelle, to remember as well, is when we actually see these years, that doesn't mean that those are the only years that are available. This is the update. Yeah. So you may find that the Ballarat Courier, for example, is actually there for the whole of the 1880s, and these were the last couple of years that needed to fill it in. And it's interesting that they're including the, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's the sponsor or the source of the original mm. microfilm or, or paper. Mm. So it's an interesting submission. And I must go and read that up because I don't really understand. I know that, um, like here, people can sponsor papers, but it might be where the originals are held. And here we are in WA, and I suspect it's where the originals are held. I didn't know there was a 
paper called The Commonwealth, and that's in the days when it was called The Empire, so it must might have been politically driven. I'm thinking about the name changing, um, but there, there you go. And over at Archives New Zealand, they're reviewing how they archive local government records that it hasn't been recently um, reviewed and updated, but actually asking for submissions. So all of you who, who have some role in using the archives in New Zealand may wish to submit, and the link will be in the description box below. Um, and you, you've got till the end of July to actually you know, submit to that. So this is for archives, libraries. Oh, I always forget all the glam sector. That they've changed it to ALGM instead of, glam was much easier to remember. But you get the idea, folks. It's a broad stroke of people who use archives, not just family historians. So everyone's got a right to have some feedback of what it is they want. Like I wish the rates books were available because we could then trace our ancestors' ownership of properties. And some councils do still have those on microfilm. It'd be nice to see them. Over in New South Wales, um, th there wasn't a lot of news of new releases from state records, but there was a number of jobs being offered. And so I I've put the link again in the description that it shows the number of jobs in the archive region as well. So not just all um, producing exhibitions, but they've just recently had a highly successful traveling ex exhibit of um, Lord or Lady Carrington's, you know, you know information's on their website, but clearly they're going to do more of these traveling exhibits. And some of you out there may be interested in working for what was the old state archives and now as part of museum history, New South Wales. Over in South Australia, May is going to be their history festival month. There's a number of presentations, either face-to-face -face in the library or the theatres or online. So there's actually an online webinar for using the records. And then the archives themselves are having an open day. So uh, the link again will be below if you want to get involved in any of those things. Heading up over to the National Archives in the UK, and I must look up the Irish ones next time, sorry, I keep forgetting. Uh, last year, I recall the release of case law searching, and they, they've given a summary about how that's gone and how they've made some changes. Um, but I did giggle about greasy poles, jam tarts, and musical songs celebrating the coronation of Edward VII. So there's, of course, lots of coronation information and divorce records back then. But the coronation of much earlier and most of the current coronations, of course, post um, after Charles I was killed off. I think it was Charles I, better get my Charles's right. Um, because all the coronation gear just about was um, destroyed. I think the silver spoon is all that survived. And so a lot of the traditions have come from that post-Reformation period. Or, um, there's probably a better word than that. And again, maybe you know it, Fiona, and I don't. But they've also given us this extra level of um, the things they're doing and understanding more about people looking for legal cases. And I thought of um, Judy Russell, of course, straight away, and I'm hoping she's read up about these and because I know she finds it fascinating, whichever the jurisdiction is. But this is like just for today, folks. So you guys in England that are waking up and maybe watching this um, on Friday morning, if there's a go slow strike today at the National Archives, and it means that you need to read carefully the conditions of what you can and can't do when you're there. They're going to be remaining open, but there's going to be quite a number of restrictions. So I'm sorry I only saw this today. So I haven't been able to put a notice up in Facebook earlier, but I will make sure I do that as soon as I've finished recording this. So if you happen to be going today to the archives, you know there's some limitations. Over at Family Tree DNA, of course, there's been a lot more blog posts this month, I suspect, because it was officially globally DNA Day on the 25th of April. So there are two links to some posts, I think, that will interest Many of you, um, for those who want to know exactly what happens to your sample, is important because they keep the samples at this company for 25 years. Um, every company keeps them for a while, uh, some of them only about 10 years. So it depends on who you're with, how long they're kept, and the backstory. And Family Tree DNA leaders in the field of, of doing family history DNA testing, uh, definitely worth a read. 
Then in the, you know, obscure stuff people come across in the world of family history is that who knew there was a UNESCO website that can took Australian world memory as part of it. And this news came to me through the Australian War Memorial and they've added 10 new sets of documents to record Australian history. And the source of these are various Wow, just such an interesting range, right down to First Fleet books by the Reverend Richard Johnson, which are there, but well worth having a squiz at this collection if you have never heard of it, like I hadn't, to go and see what's there. Field survey books, maps all over the place, old colonists, photographic mosaics from South Australia, um, the, the heritage collection of houses. But the other one that really interested me the most is the top, and I must tell my cousin Beryl, don't let me forget Fiona to do it, because Frank Cash photographs of site demolitions. Her ancestor had just built this amazing hotel, which got demolished to build the bridge, um, and it didn't do well for their finances. And I'm and she's always been looking for photographs of this building and not been able to find them. And I'm wondering they're in the Frank Cash collections of um, the pulling down of to build the bridge. So I'm hoping I've found something useful for her. And the other one that I just neglected to include in the list to send Fiona a couple of weeks ago was, I, many of you know I like to listen to podcasts, and I found this one particularly fascinating, and I would encourage you all to find some time to listen to it, because it was really interesting about um, not just the, the different ways things were reported, but how you might find them in records. So it's an interesting discussion in record sets from this period of time. I uh, did think of a few people I know up there, but the bill of mortality. So, yeah, maybe not for bedtime listening, but definitely worth having a listen to. And the other thing I came across in my podcast listing, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was that recommended to me. This is a online site called The Economist, and they actually had this detailed discussion about how the maps were done in Britain and how the survey did them and how they walked the county to do them. And I think it's always important for us to understand a record's development and the maps are no different. So not only is the web page there, it made me then go and have a look at some of these ordnance surveys and I found a lot of them are free to download at Wikipedia. You know how I said you'd be going off, Fee, to look at more maps? I know, you know me, I love maps. I found these nice Scottish ones for you. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, so, you know, you might be busy for the next two weeks and we'll see you at the next news. Yeah. Um, and and I just wanted to say I'm not doing any speaking for a wee while because I've got too many other commitments, but Fiona is speaking for the Genealogical Society of Queensland are having a, a family day on particularly on methodology and B is one of the specialist presenters, and the link will be in the description box if you can go on the 13th. Sure will. So, V, I think we're done unless there was something else you wanted to add to the week's news. Oh, look, I think that's quite enough for them to be racing off to look at. Uh, it should keep them pretty busy for the weekend, and um, we hope you have lots of fun with that. Don't forget to subscribe. Subscribing means that you find out when we release something new, like maybe a find the past find my past newspaper video perhaps next week so you do want to subscribe and and just keep up to date and um we'll be back in a couple of weeks so hope you enjoyed the coronation or not yes. as the case may be because it's going to be an interesting fortnight about history regardless so uh good luck with all your research and we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks and i'll keep your eye out for the newspaper tips and tricks from fee Bye.